Hello and welcome to our virtual rhinoplasty meetings. My name is Dr. Cameron McIntosh and I'm the president of SORSA or the Society of Rhinoplasty Surgeons of South Africa. So during the coronavirus lockdown period, we decided to have bi-weekly Zoom meetings. We specifically chose teachers from around the world to be able to cover many topics. Unfortunately, due to patient confidentiality, we can't actually show you the real talks. However, the very interesting interactive question and answer sessions is what we're going to be showing you. We want to give a shout out to our colleagues around the world fighting coronavirus. Please look after yourselves and be safe. So I'm not going to say anything more. Enjoy the show. So for episode number one, we're going to Perth, Australia to listen to Tun Pham speak to us about 3D imaging and maximizing rhinoplasty results. Questions? I talk too much already. I'm sorry about that. Can, can, I, can I ask you too, and what can you talk to us a little bit about uh, surface anatomy and what uh, your anatomical landmarks are, are when you harvest lower for seven, four, eight? Right, okay. So, um, usually, you know, the patient on the table already. So, the, um, the seven and eight is the most inferior one immediately. So you probably the super sternum. Mm -hmm. You run your finger. I remark, you know, it's really a zigzag sign, you know, like you know, the rib go like that. So you palpate and you paint the far lateral, which is twelve rib, with the floating one, mm -hmm. right there. So I don't, you know, I don't see these again. I don't, you know, um, I only caught up once or twice with, you know, with a uh, cost of college, but um, so the media one, <clears throat> so super sternum. You go along, and if you take the, you palpate the sympathetic and where the costal control cartilage joins the sympathetic control junction, mm -hmm. go about two centimeters lateral to it and drop down, you usually find where the seven is. Okay. Because you want to go too close. So you, want, you, know, um, so you go, you know, and you want more bony aspects sometimes, you, you know, in case you need bone and cartilage together, you go with more lateral. Two trees at the costal junction uh, of the junction between the costal cartilage and the septum. Go to the lateral, go down to the inferior edge, that's usually eight. Come up a bit and you paint the rib. That's eight, seven, you know. And Tian, yes. Can you can you possibly just give me um, some feedback? I see using dorsal augmentations with costal cartilage. Um, what do you do in terms of? Uh, is is that your sort of uh, standard in terms of dorsal augmentation? Tell me where your DCF grafts um, kind of come in. I only use this uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and your choice and your sort of choice and and the yeah. and the choice you make in terms of the two. Sure. Uh, firstly, you know, depending on your patient uh, presentation if they are um, revision round plastic which are normally the most common off um, is I don't try to use uh, DCF because that thing is too soft they don't give um, hardness it's good for augmentation to the dorsum and a bit of carriage but that's really you know it's just a bit too soft and then and the skin is so tight when you use those things they just contract and flatten the graph out they don't give you form they don't give you a sharp, nice form to it. So uh, that's the first. If you've got soft tissue, like in a minor augmentation, like a primary for you know, an Asian lady who wants a bit of softness, I think that's great because you can use that uh, to do it. But I think in a contracted nose and you want to augment a lot, it's just going to compress. The skin envelope will contract. It just splay out uh, your graph. And you just just amorphous. It don't give a form. That's the first. And the second thing for that is that a lot of time this revision nose, you need to push the nose downward because they're looking at the nose, they, you know, set them. So you need to spread a graph and then you need also to push the nose inferiorly. And the DCF doesn't do anything with like that. With the dorsal cartilage, you can use a separate extension graph and then the dorsal with the tongue groove come in and push it down. If you want to push down, you've got to lock it in place. Because otherwise the skin was just going to contract backward. You need something strong to push it down. So you increase the length, projection, uh, and rotation. So that's you know, so that's the demographic I'll find. 
But if um, none of those happen and they don't want to rip and other things, sure, you can use it, you know, but it's much softer. So I think DCF is more of a soft tissue augmentation rather than a solid augmentation. They're very soft. And, uh, they're nice, but they're soft. And it needs good skin envelope expansion to do that. Uh, if you got contracting, I think it's not much use. And also this, you know, unless you do very tight, you get a little pocket in your DCF and you get irregularity. And I think, and especially thin skin, um, irregularity. So that's the, for Asian rhinoplasty, sometimes you know, I give them the choice, either rib cartilage or, but I, I do use Gore-Tex, you know, the patch, not the solid form, the, the, the patch for the dorsal part. Then the uh, septal stainless graph, you use your septal cartilage plus the uh, conchal cartilage for your um, uh, shield graph and thing. So those uh, the two. A lot of times DCF, unless you have a lot of cartilage, um, it's not very much augmentation in the first place. Unless you go rip and, you know, if you use rip, then I don't see why you need to use DCF, you use the rip cartilage when there's plenty of rip available. Is that... Yeah, I mean, I, that's. Uh, I, I guess my consideration is in, in in terms of how frequently you encounter uh, cartilage warping in terms of your solid cartilage onlay grafts, which obviously uh, doesn't occur. I mean, I. I, I well, I that do occur, but I think. It's, yeah, um, I'm sure it does occur, but I think you know, so far it's not a huge issue. The reason why, because I harvest the cartilage full thickness, not half and half. And when you slice the cartilage, you apply it obliquely. So you include both the peripheral, like the high line part of cartilage and both sides, make sure there's both sides and those, those two side braces. Okay. Um, and then prevent warping. So, um, so that's, you know, if you gonna calf, or if you calf the solid bit, you make sure everything is central. And the other thing is when you carve it, you throw it in the water, you wait, um, you know, at first. And then, uh, so that's uh, it's less an issue if you do central, but you preserve a bit of uh, a cartilage around it. Thanks. And girls, everybody, thank you very, very much. We we, we don't want to make this too long. Um, I, I can't thank our Australian friend enough for waking up at two o'clock in the morning to be with us. This is really astounding. So we will be having our next meeting on Thursday and uh, Abdul Goxel from Turkey is going to be joining us. Then uh, the following, we've got three more weeks after that, another six different speakers. I'll put something on the group to tell you exactly who they are. But uh, needless to say, I think people will be very happy to see who the different people are who are going to be talking. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, John.